next on the program is Öde Nerdrum, who will talk about Western civilization. Uh, Öde is a classic figurative painter and also writes for civilization about poetry and music. Öde, the stage is yours. Hello. Hello. Uh, Should I talk in that order or just that one? Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I, I thought I was going to hold, hold this speech in Norwegian. <laughs> Since like 15 minutes ago, I learned it was in English. Uh, which makes this a lot more fun. Uh, let me double check. Uh, are all your cell phones off? It would be very disturbing if they weren't. Uh, I'm very honored to have been asked to hold uh, a speech here. I'm uh, I am not, like many others here are, uh, educated on a university with a master's degree in philosophy or something equivalent to that. Uh, I, am, uh, I have been taught classical figurative painting by my father, so I have a much more, my background is much more into uh, craft than philosophy specifically. Uh, but where I come from, uh, philosophy is very important. Uh, after all, if you, if you paint classical figurative paintings today, in, <laughs> in today's art world, you have to have a philosophical approach because you're basically doing something that is um, on the edge of what is considered to be tasteful in today's art world. Uh, so that is why, in my background, we study so much philosophy. Uh, I was uh, actually, it was suggested by Mr. Taig, who is one of the um, guys putting this up in Fox, that I should talk about the best of the West, and I thought that was a very good opportunity to, uh, to dive into this concept of best. Uh, it, it seems to me that when people are historians, it's usually just two kinds of historians. Either it's an historian who's interested in, very, in a very particular time, or it's the other historians who are just concerned with the fall of the Roman Empire, or, or the fall of civilizations in general. And I think that when we're sitting here today, it's sort of like a gathering on the sinking ship we call the West. Uh, and we all pretend to know that we know how to let it not sink. Uh, but I will give it a try, uh, because uh, I will start uh, with this, since this is a conference for conservatism. I believe the architect behind this reconstruction is in this building today, at least I saw him down in the, the winter room, Arne Sødal. Uh, this is an example of one of the great victories for conservatism in recent time in Norway. This building was uh, burnt down. I mean, how many here are familiar with this? Yeah, okay, quite many. Uh, but <laughs> we, we shouldn't forget it that this was actually rebuilt after the fire in the 90s. Um, and this leads to my point about the best. Uh, because conservatism is really absurd without the concept of the best. Uh, it is why I usually prefer the term classicism or classical over conservatism, because classical uh, refers to a standard. That is what the word means. Um, it was, uh, and, and we even have an epoch describing this, the classical period in ancient Greece, because this is the period where we created the standards for so many things, like uh, the rule of law, uh, democracy, the standard of beauty, of the form. It's all about the standards, and this can be led back to the Greek word uh, canon, which means the standard. It's just like uh, in, in Paris, in the Bank of Paris, they have the standard for the meter. It's in gold. I don't know if any one of you have seen it, but <laughs> if you are a manufacturer and you construct like uh, meter measurements, you have that standard in Paris to know what the meter looks like. Uh, but the Greeks did so much more than this. Uh, 
they studied a standard for everything. Uh, and I think that is what makes ancient Greece so special. Uh, for example, the Olympic Games, you, have, you make standardized games where you compete and you see who's the best. And in order to compete, you have to have a standard. You have to have a measurement to see who's the best runner, who's the best disco thrower, etc., etc. And we cannot take this for granted, especially when considering the aestheticism of ancient Greece, uh, that they actually widely discussed what is the ideal form, what is the ideal sculpture, which they did not do in other cultures, such as Egypt. Uh, if, you, if you look at what we have left from the Egyptian civilization, it's a lot more power-oriented. For example, Ramses the Great, he would have these kinds of uh, friezes uh, with full of writing on them to describe his power and his wealth, etc., etc. The Greeks were not like that. For example, if you study uh, the funeral oration by Pericles, you could blame democracy for that, that he has to justify the war to the Athenians, but even still, the, the great part of the speech is where he tells the Athenian people why their culture is superior, why their values are the best values. And in aesthetics, the Greeks sought to make the ideal form. Here's uh, Hermes uh, with the Dionysus child. Uh, you can see it in Olympus in, in Greece. And it's so much more than just naturalism. They sought to... I mean, this, I mean, this is a little bit dangerous almost, because you can almost go get into race theory. But that's, that's not the point. The point is that uh, you find out what is the standard, standardized beauty. For example, that the, the, the head goes eight times in the body, etc., etc. And you have the great uh, architect and theorist Vitruvius, who made several volumes on architecture. It was an attempt to make a standard for what is beautiful architecture. See. There. Uh, this is just to give an example of something which is not canon related. This is uh, a stone formation. I mean, you know, thinking back to Mr. Sördal's uh, church, this is called the, the Troll Dick. And it was a, a rock that stood out of the mountain. And this is just an example to show you a sort of conservatism that does not have this philosophy of the canon integrated. Because uh, uh, when you want to preserve this rock formation, it's not according to a standard of human achievement or a higher ideal of a perfectionized form, but you're conserving it because you think it's funny. Uh, and that's something entirely different. Um, when uh, this this sculpture here, this uh, sculpture group, La Ucom, uh, we have no idea who, who made it. It was found in a vineyard in Italy around 1500. This became the standardized sculpture for sculptures in the Renaissance. Uh, after, you know, famously, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, uh, that did not have standardized forms. Uh, where the standard was Jesus, so to say, or the right belief. Here we have an example of, this is a very good example of the difference between tradi traditionalism and classicism. Uh, because it's, the tradition is to depict Virgin Mary. That is true in both these cases. This is a, a middle-aged painting from, I believe it is in Spain. And here, in the bloom of the Renaissance, I believe this is Bellini. The tradition is to depict Mary, but the classicism is to find the ideal form of how to depict it. That is the central difference. Uh, in this situation, it becomes a symbol that uh, we are Christians and therefore we repeat the symbols. Uh, but here you are approaching an ideal.
And here comes the difficulty with the, <laughs> the term canon, because it's, uh, throughout European history, it's an eternal discussion through what is classical, what is the canon, because we can never know for sure, right? Um, and this is Raphael to the left, who by many in the 1500s were believed to have finally found <laughs> the standard. He's the standard. And all painters after Raphael, uh, at least until around 1600, painted very similar to him because they believed they had found the standard for excellence. Everything from rendering the skin, the form, uh, uh, the proportions, they believe they had found the perfect standard. But then this guy comes along, Caravaggio, and breaks completely with it. Uh, and he, in a way, revealed that they had not found the canon. They sought the canon, but it was the wrong canon. Uh, and this is the eternal difficulty, as I see it, for conservatism. Now, how do you know what is the right thing to conserve? Because we have so many examples in history where a new guy comes and it turns out to be more right. Uh, you know, I cannot oh, uh, hold this speech without mentioning my father. This is the murder of Andreas Bader by Odd Nordrum, my father, from 1978. Uh, which is a similar shock as Caravaggio was when he came in the 1600s era. And this is the central point of the canon, is that uh, the canon operates as a role model for imitation. It has to inspire to imitation. And several philosophers have mentioned this fact about great pieces of painting and sculptures. Uh, Kant, for example, uh, Immanuel Kant, that it has to have, be a role model for imitation. You see it and you see its greatness and you know that I want to copy this. Uh, I will get back to Kant because he's a little bit problematic uh, after all. But you can see that in the history of Europe, and this is something you don't see in other cultures, it's an continuous discussion about what is the canon, what represents the best. Uh, and, for example, in this time, and the classicism has a way of, or all cultures can become decadent, and some people would argue that Anger here is more classical. Uh, I would say that Renoir, perhaps in some ways, is more classical, because uh, here, the classical form has become very tightened and decadent, in a way. It's not alive anymore. It's not the Greek sculpture that breathes. Uh, maybe it breathes more here. But uh, there's a lot of disagreement. Uh, the point is that you're looking for the standard, not necessarily that we end up agreeing. Uh, and that leads me to the 1900s, and you could say the philosophy of working against the standard. Uh, that is um, something you see from many philosophers in the 1900s, in particular uh, the critical theory and such, where you're not attempting to reach the standard anymore, on the contrary, you are applauded if you break with the standard. And ironically, that has become the standard today. Um, here you have the new Dijkman library in Oslo, and here you have the old one. And of course, the, crit uh, the, the people criticizing this will say that they are just repeating old forms, they're not trying out anything new. But that is, of course, the famous point of uh, Edmund Burke, you know, that the problem with the French Revolution is that, because the French Revolution, they were attempting to bring in old classical values, but they were doing it too fast, right? And they were forgetting that 
there might be some qualities to what we already have that we're not seeing, that we don't, that we don't appreciate until we've lost them. And the benefits of sticking with what we already have is that it has worked over time, right? Uh, we have understood things over time that we necess not necessarily can put words into. Uh, but modernism is so much more than just criticizing traditionalism. It is very much to make a, an antidote to the canon. Very interestingly, that while modernism was having its heydays in Western Europe, especially in France, but also Norway, in the Soviet, they were actually very classical, classically oriented. Not just in painting. This is a portrait by Plastov from the 1930s, I believe, and this is Jan Heiberg in Norway around the same time. And they're both quite traditional, in a way, because it's a portrait of someone sitting. But here we can see that Mr. Heiberg has adhered to the new ideals from Paris, which is to break with the attempt of making an elegant, realistic, elevated depiction of a person. It's a critic of looking, finding the canon. And Soviet, uh, ironically, because <laughs> socialist in uh, policy, were very elitistic culturally wise, not just in painting, but also in music and architecture as well. Yeah, and that, that leads me to the point of the philosophers of the critical theory, and here you have many, many bad guys. Uh, you have Marcuse, Adorno, many others, but their battle against this classical canon was very much based on the idea that it could be power, that you believe you have found a standardized way of doing it and you believe this is the best, but how do you really know? How do you really know that it's the best? And uh, we have so many examples in history of something that has actually held a higher excellence, but which has uh, been held down by a power. So you could say that we don't ever really know if we have found the standards. And of course, criticizing the West with its colonialism. This is Victoria Station in Mumbai, where <laughs> with European standardized uh, ideas of harmony, harmonic forms in architecture is mixed with elements from India. And under modernism, and, and I, I want to go back to Immanuel Kant, because while Immanuel Kant believed that the standards of painting, art, sculpture, whatever, should be recognized as a role model for imitation, Kant rejected the idea that we could reach this model, or that at least that we could describe it. So he acknowledged that the painter or sculpture can reach a standard, but we cannot plan it. It comes from somewhere. It's, he is describing the genius, and that is uh, the invention of the genius that they come up with in the 1700s. Uh, because we have to remember that among painters and sculptors before the 1800s, there were often workshops with several people working on the same sculpture, because they believed that they could find this ideal form together. We have several examples of this. We have Rubens. You never know if Rubens has painted it or one of his assistants. You have the Laucon group that I showed earlier from ancient Greece, Rome, probably sculpted by many, and the list is long. Uh, but with the breaking of the standard comes the notion of uh, the, the genius and thereby working together to reach a goal becomes completely absurd because we don't know what that standard is. 
And here is, uh, I'm not going to mention his name. Uh, because uh, actually this painting was almost bought by Norway when it was exhibited here in the 1930s. That's probably something I haven't heard before. But Norway rejected buying it for 30,000 kroner, I think. <laughs> According to me, a wise decision. But Looking for this excellence, this standardized form, requires a lot of humility on our, beh our behalf, I think. Because while the criticism of looking for the ideal form, that we can never be sure, or as Kant put it, we cannot be sure, absolutely not, while they can be partly true, uh, it's very tempting uh, for many reasons to indulge yourself in those thoughts. For example, um, because we can never reach that standards ourselves. Uh, and I think that the classical standards is a lot about humility, because we have to realize that some people are better sculptors than us, better painters. And, uh, and our job as humans is to admire them. Uh, but interestingly, uh, history is written by the winners. And while that awful monstrous painting that I showed you before was being celebrated, these things were made. Uh, and these are people that have gone under the radar in the 1900s world of paintings and sculptures, etc. Uh, to the left is uh, Kate Kollwitz, German uh, draftsman and uh, etcher. And to the right, this is from a concentration camp in France. The painter's name is Felix Nussbaum. And that leads me to my thoughts on conservatism today and the most important battle for conservatism. Because we have to discuss that. What is it that we want to preserve? Conservatism is about preserving, right? And uh, as I said to begin with, conservatism without a notion of the best is absurd because it will end up in a traditionalism, like visiting an African tribe, and you ask them why they are mutilating the girl's sex organ, and they answer, because we've always done it, right? That's a very bad uh, standpoint, because you haven't actively thought of the best. You're just doing it because your ancestors did it. So. Conservatism is absolutely absurd, potentially really dangerous without the notion of the best. And I think that when we should choose our battle for today, conservatism is the most important battle. I think there are many things we can do wrong. I think, personally, that the conservatives who are fighting against the gender movement, I think that is a very bad idea. It's uh, what we call it in English, blindvei. It's a what? It's a it's a dead end uh, because that is not the most important battle, in my opinion. Uh, if we look at the 1900s and the major problems we've seen in the 1900s, uh, the way I view it, it's first socialism, and luckily we managed to defeat that, uh, at least partly. Uh, and. Yeah, but like we have social democracy in Norway now, but like real hardcore socialism, we managed to get rid of in Europe. And secondly is modernism, and thirdly is consumerism. That is what I view as the three big issues of the 1900s. And while we should celebrate winning over socialism, we still have we still have modernism and consumerism to deal with, uh, which leads me to my thoughts on the, ba the conservative battles of today. Uh, here we have a poster for Philips Lamps, um, a good example of consumerism gone wrong. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the light bulb cartel in the 1920s, where they agreed on making a maximum 
uh, living time for the lamps to sell more lamps. And that is overall in the Western world today. Um, ironically, it's a sort of a opposite to modernism, because while modernism is obsessed with the different, uh, the special, the unique, what, it, what contradicts the ideal form, uh, and is special and unique. Uh, consumerism is about what is not unique and what we're filling our mouths with every day. Uh, I want to quote Adam Smith, not directly, I just want to point out something he said, because he's often criticized for having endorsed consumerism by many people who are critical to consumerism. Adam Smith, the great economical philosopher. But Adam Smith said something that was very right. He said that since the future is all about consumerism, the most important job of education in the future is to teach people to become good consumers. And I come from a draft uh, background, from a um, handworking background with painting, etc. And I know a thing or two about the crisis today, about uh, craft, but also products. Here they are painting. They don't know it, but they're probably painting with plastic paint, these guys. And I believe that Adam Smith is right, that the consumers need to become good consumers. And it's unfortunately, it's something that the educational systems have not been able to teach us. What's the difference between cotton and linen? Um, how do we see if a painting is well made or not? Um, what's the difference between linseed oil, alkyd paint, acrylic, etc., etc.? This is the National Theatre. Uh, it is, at this instant, deteriorating. And it's a disgrace that it hasn't been renovated. It has been deteriorating for many years. No one seems to find the money for it or the time. Uh, so, hopefully, this, this is a very concrete battle. Uh, but the question is, is it worth preserving? That is a question we have to ask ourselves. There, there are some people in the Conservative Party in Norway who do not think it's worth preserving. And we need to talk with them. And that leads me to my conclusion, uh, or at least my wish for conservatives today uh, and for this conference, is the wish that we come up with a new standard, a new canon. I think a lot of people today are uh, are dreaming about new standards in this very wild and messy world uh, where everything is allowed, so to say. Uh, we are... Uh, it's so many products, so many things, so many opportunities, but we have no idea, we have no notion of the best anymore. Um, frankly, we have been told that looking for the best is fascistic or uh, at least that it is elitistic or something like that. But I, I believe that many people are looking for a new standard. So with that, I, I thank you very much and look forward to hearing all the other speeches. Thank you.